Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Seeds of Liberty podcast, episode 17. So before we get into anything, we're just going to hear from Jeremy on the, um, the BIPCOT license. Yes, the Seeds of Liberty podcast is covered by the BIPCOT NoGov license. This allows for reuse by anyone except for governments and the agents thereof. You can find out more information about this at BIPCOT.org. That's Bravo, India, Papa, Charlie, Oscar, Tango. Dot org. So today we're going to uh, interview uh, our guest who is Prof. CJ from the uh, Prof. CJ Dangerous History podcast. Um, he's an anarchist and a history professor. Uh, we're going to talk about that because uh, that's a really awesome thing. Um, <laughs> he's got his, his website profcj.org and he's on Stitcher and iTunes and, and on lrn.fm. Um, and uh, perhaps we'll talk about um, you know America's transition from uh, oligarchy to corporate fascist Leviathan at present. But also, I think we should touch on maybe the American Revolution, since we have the uh, wonderful July Fourth Independence Day. Everyone's going to be uh, stuffing hot dogs and uh, <clears throat> beer down their throats um, in celebration of their own uh, oppression. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, pro uh, so, CJ, thanks a lot for coming on the show. Hey, you're welcome. Thanks for inviting me on. Yeah, so um, you know, I just started listening to your podcast a few weeks ago, and I started with the uh, the Revolutionary War um, part one. I'm on part two, but man, such awesome stuff! Like, I just, I, yeah, I can't over it. I can't get over it. Um, you know, you know, D Dave was saying before how how you know you're learning something. When you're learning something, you just don't want to stop listening, right? You just don't want, like a book, right? You just don't want to put it down. And yeah, I definitely feel like that. It's really eye opening, and it's like, <laughs> it's like, you know, I think, how come my my government school teacher, history teacher, is not teach like this. Then I'm thinking, wait a minute. Oh, they're, they're government school. Okay, now I get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're, they're not going to teach you that their entire job and institution and everything is bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so before we get into this, why don't you, can you give us some background as to your um, evolution or pro progression as, a, as an anarchist, how you became an anarchist, and how, you know, how that's affected your teaching of history? Yeah, well... I think that we're all born anarchists. I actually do believe that. And then we have statism kind of bludgeoned into us from all the institutions of, you know, the way most families operate, the way that uh, schools operate, and, you know, all, all these different things, the media and all these things. I think we're born anarchists and then we're morphed into status. And so it's the small you know, weirdo fringe of us that eventually kind of claw our way back to kind of what we originally were. So I, I came from basically a standard right-wing family. And the one thing that I, I never quite could buy was all the social conservatism stuff. That was like the chink in the armor for me. Mm -hmm. um, I, I never quite bought the war on drugs. I never quite bought, you know, the idea of, of writing religious moralities into state laws and that sort of thing. And so I was kind of like a conservatarian for a long, long time, which was a weird enough thing to be, you know, going to graduate school for history. That was, you know, I, I was always the odd man out. But, um, you know, I, I was just in conservatarian limbo for many years. And honestly, one of the things that actually made me an anarchist was just learning more and more history. You know, at this point, I look back and I go, how the hell can somebody study this stuff in any depth? and not end up being an anarchist. Like, I, I just don't get it. It's, it's nothing but a catalog of like, you know, stupid and evil people doing stupid and evil shit. <laughs> and I, I don't understand like, you know, how many examples do you need to realize that, you know, the state is a bad idea? Yeah, that, that's my rebuttal to um, when someone says, anarchy has never been tried and, and can't work. I go, well, government's been tried forever and has never worked provably yeah 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 i mean there's you know all of the uh the the boogeymen of anarchism are entirely theoretical and speculative um the boogeyman of the state are right there for everybody to see it's... yes indeed um <laughs> and that's why the study of history is so important right because you know, as they say, history does repeat itself, and you know, it's just with different costumes, different hats, and different badges, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, different, and, different names. <laughs> and the other important thing about history is that so much of the mythologies that people believe that keep them entrenched in their statism are ultimately based on their understanding of history. 
So, mm -hmm. you know, if you think that the U.S. government is, you know, basically the embodiment of kind of Captain America ideals, and uh, you know, Washington's a great guy, Lincoln freed the slaves, and is such a mm -hmm. such a great man, and all this sort of thing, you know, you you believe <laughs> all these myths. We saved the world from Nazis single-handedly in World War II, and you know. By believing all these myths, it then makes you amenable to statism today. Yeah, the capitalist America saved the world by using the forces of communism to def... It just doesn't make sense when you really look at it objectively. <laughs> right. Like uh, the Cold War, it's like all America did was out-commie the commies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. And, you know... I, you, you can find there were people who already understood this even back then. You know some of those, uh, what what Murray Rothbard calls the old right, those sort of anti-war conservative types of like the 40s and 50s. Some of them were saying at the very beginning of the Cold War, "Hey, don't you realize if we keep following this path, we might end up almost as collectivist as these communists were so scared of." And we we have even more because. I guess people live more comfortably here in America than in uh, Russia. Russia, they had the, the, the thumbprint of Stalin, the thumbprint of Gorbachev on, on top of their head the whole day. So they hated it, you know. Um, people here, they, they live comfortably, you know, mostly, and they don't feel the oppressiveness. Yeah, yeah, it's sort of more Brave New World than 1984. Although there are elements of 1984 for sure. Absolutely. Well, it's it's the whole you know it's the frog in the pot scenario. The uh, the powers that be have just they've they've learned from each other. And I, I mean, obviously, you would know better than I think all three of us combined. Although I like to think that's that's been my area of, uh, you know, my field of study, which got me into anarchism too, is the whole history angle. And the one thing that you the one word that you said earlier um, that I think sums it up is is depth, and that's the problem. Most people, even the ones in the you know the in the history profession don't really go very deep because <laughs> right. as you said you know how, how else would they miss this well obviously you know they, you have to stop at a certain point and that's you know most people's understanding of, of history is is obviously very superficial I know it was for me before I got into all this and uh, you know like I, I mentioned to you beforehand it was uh, before we started the show that for for me it was it was something like the whiskey rebellion which you just recently did a, a show on which was great uh, by the way um, but that was for me you know and all of a sudden it's like wow why have I never heard of this besides hearing the name in passing why haven't I heard the story why you know and once you start digging it's it is it's it's like an addiction for for people that actually have that thirst for knowledge and you just as you know as we've all mentioned now you can't really stop <laughs> you just have to go 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 and uh yeah yeah you know one of the things that that kind of steered me away from kind of uh you know typical nationalism and whatever that i was raised around was in graduate school i studied the british empire that was kind of my main field of focus and I was able to look at that more objectively because it wasn't my country. Mm -hmm. And I and I, you know, learned all like the the bad stuff they did. And then it was like, you know, you look in the mirror at your own country and go, hey, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of these things that the British Empire did, Team America's now, you know, the ones doing those very things, and in some cases doing them worse than the British did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hitler, Hitler, and Stalin and Mao—they could see what the, you know, what the federal government and the TSA and and the NSA have achieved today. They would be, I think, green with envy. <laughs> you know, it's yeah, like, well, they damn sure would be jealous of drones. That's that's something. Oh. I mean, they would just give their kidneys to have drones. I think. Oh yeah. Oh my God. Yes. If Hitler had drones, oh. <laughs> it would be a scary world. My there friend. wouldn't be a Jew left alive in the world if Hitler had drones. I don't think. <laughs> And the other thing that's interesting is when, when talking about discussing history, like for me, um, you know, what really brought me into volunteerism and, and anarcho-capitalism is learning about monetary history, like the Federal Reserve and you know, precious metals and what their significance is in, uh, you know, in the monetary system before, you know, like 1933 when it, before it, was, you know, it was banned and everything. Um, and that really got me into it. And it was funny when I talk about that kind of stuff and then people, as a rebuttal, they use the... Um, <laughs> propagandized type history that they learned in government <laughs> school <laughs> as course. a rebuttal. I'm like, what? Don't you understand the, the contradiction there? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Th that was something that I came to late. I, I came to economics and economic history late. It was actually after I was out of graduate school, and I had already been teaching for probably a couple of years. 
and then the the huge you know financial meltdown of 08 hit and that was kind of the thing that got me saying you know i need to look more into this economic stuff and so i i just went into that totally blank slate and i just started looking at different economic theories and schools of thought and things and sort of comparing them to what i knew about history and you know eventually i hit upon the austrian you know school of of economics and the austrian business cycle theory and the more I, lo I learned about that, the more I realized, you know, it, it matched up best with the history of what actually has happened than any other, you know, economic models or theories or anything out there. Well, yeah, the protectionism is protectionism is 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 a scary drug, so to say. It's 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 caused the collapse of many many empires, and yeah. all you have to do is see that the only way you can ensure protection or at least attempt to is by through competition. And once you take that competition away with price fixing and, and uh, you know, all this other regulations through government and you, you get your fascist, you know, your mercantilism, your, your um, almost feudal as far as economics go uh, yeah. type systems in place, they, they always collapse because they get so bloated and so dragged down and so inefficient. You know, there's industries that exist only because of government and they're the ones that try to protect themselves. You know, like Lockheed Martin would not want to see the government go away because they would go mm -hmm. bankrupt. Boeing would not want to see the government go away because they would go bankrupt. So you have these huge vested interests in the, in the, in the, in the economy and, and, and their private ownership of these companies and their stock market or their stockholders and stuff that they use every dollar they can spare to lobby and get that protection from the government, get those no-bid government contracts. Yeah, and, and even, you know, big agribusiness is an example of that, too. And uh, if I remember right, the Department of Agriculture, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, came in under that wonderful hero we all love, Honest Abe. Um, it, it got a lot more active and got a lot more into micromanaging farmers in the 20th century, but I'm pretty sure it was Honest Abe who actually started that whole shindig. I, I, I think you may be <laughs> correct about that. I just I grimace every time I hear his name. He's like my... I, I don't know. He's the lightning rod. Every time I hear that, I just want to yell. He's the worst American president of all time, in my, in my book. Well, FD, FDR is pretty. He's, he's up there, too. Well, I, I live in Alabama, so if Abraham Lincoln would not have waged civil war, FDR would have never been my president. Mm. So he can't be. True. So, I mean, if you live in the South, Abraham Lincoln has to be your worst president. <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I still, to, to, to I still think Woodrow Wilson... Woodrow yeah. Wilson is yeah. uh, those are the, in the, my worst book, the worst three. Those, those are the worst three. I yeah. think Woodrow Wilson kind of had his hands tied. I mean, the bankers got him elected, and then he was just doing the will of the bankers after he got elected. Well, it it is so. hard with him to untie like what all he was actually you know doing and what all he was just being sock puppeted into doing. But you know, at the end of the day, I, I, I look at it as if you're being sock puppeted into doing horrible stuff. That is ultimately on you, though. You were El Presidente. Still. Of course. Well, no, yeah. absolutely. Well, they. Just, I mean, they'll kill him. <laughs> sure. But yeah, but that, but but pragmatically, and they'll, and they'll put someone in that will. Yes, but he, yeah, he may be making the pragmatic choice for him at that point. But that's the same argument that I that I present to people that try to, you know, that the the same people that try to say that, you know, they defend the troops that even though they hate what the government does. Well, no, they're still, they're still make, taking the actions. They're still, you know, he, he even if he was being led by the nose in some fashion he still made the decisions to say anything different is to strip him of all moral agency and that's just you know that's ridiculous he he still played his part you so definitely if, give up moral agency when you become a politician <laughs> well yeah but you know what i mean they still i, I think it's uh for me i, I don't I, I stopped caring about who the worst is because I, I figure they just they get progressively worse because you know things get progressively worse so who's ever in uh, charge harrison now? harrison's the best president <laughs> Is is he is he the one that died like after a month? Was that yes? It? Yeah. He's the, yes. He's the best died. president of all time. Was it even was it even a month? I thought it was only like eighteen days or something. I forget. And that was, that was natural causes, right? He he got tuberculosis or something. Sure. Um, he, yeah, it was actually pneumonia. He gave. Pneumonia, right? He he was he was the uh, most elderly president elected up to that point in American history, and he wanted to show the country that he was still vigorous and hardy. So he gave uh, one of the longest inaugural addresses in American history outside on a bitter cold day 
<laughs> and you know how your mom always tells you to wear, wear your coat and your mittens when you go outside and it's cold? Well, he didn't listen to that. He went oh, out there with no overcoat or nothing, and he ended up getting sick and dying of pneumonia. Wow. So every time someone says, hey, so Dave, who's your favorite president? It's like, it's like knee-jerk, Harrison. It's like I don't even think about it. It's like Harrison. <laughs> but um, <laughs> CJ, I, I, oh, go on, go on. Oh, I, I was just going to throw in there that somebody, I think it might have been the Incans, had a practice where their king was technically dead. Like, when the the uh, the patriarch of the royal family would die, they would mummify him, and like he was their next king, and they would toss off the the last mummy and put the new mummy in place. And I, I've often thought that you know a mummified president might be worth uh, looking into as a reform, you know, <laughs> or, or or a weekend at Bernie's type president, you know, just <laughs> bring him to I, parades I, and I wave would just his like hand a president a bit. that gets in and does nothing, like sits in the well, Oval Office. He just tweets all day, ha ha, in the Oval Office. <laughs> yeah, well, you know who was pretty close to that was Warren Harding. Warren Harding was just yeah, he's, drinking he's and one of playing my favorite. poker during Prohibition. Yeah, yeah mm-hmm. so Har- Hard- Harding and, and Coolidge are two of the best presidents of all time, as far as economically. Yeah, and you know Martin Van Buren was pretty good on economics too. Although uh, Martin Van Buren continued the um, uh, expulsion of the Indians in the East and and the uh, the war against the Seminoles and so on. So. You well, know. you got to think. Those were dirty redskins, okay? You're not thinking clearly here, okay? <laughs> you got you got to get them out of there, man. They're killing our women and our children. You got to believe the propaganda, okay? That's <laughs> right. They weren't full-fledged merkins, so they didn't have souls. You're not exactly. This, you're not looking at this through the proper prejudice lens. You they have did not believe sure. in Jesus, okay? That's if you don't believe in Jesus and you're not heathens, white, get out. Heathens, you're, they you're, were. You get out, okay? <laughs> So, CJ, I have a question uh, that I think a lot of uh, uh, constitutionalists um, have in mind. You know, when they're like, and I guess teabaggers, when they're, you know, when they're criticizing <laughs> the government and, and they're like, uh, you know, you know, the government shouldn't be doing this, government shouldn't do that, and and then they turn around and they support, you know, people like Thomas Jefferson, and uh, you know, I guess the the, the um, generic term of the founders, right? But Thomas right. Jefferson specifically, like, can you go into, you know, how different? Like what he wrote and what he espoused before he became president, and then the things that he did while he was president, just just to you know just to debunk people who revere him as a god, as you know the god of liberty. <laughs> yeah, well, well, just a, just a few things I, I would mention. I mean, to be fair, compared to most 20th century presidents, he does look pretty freaking good by comparison, right? So, you know, it's yeah. relative, but... <laughs> of course. Um, you know, the, the Louisiana Purchase technically was unconstitutional. Um, he basically used Alexander Hamilton's fiscal system to pay for it, a system that he had tried uh, to stop from being created uh-huh. in the first place a couple of years say, earlier. He, I was going to say, he railed against Hamilton the whole time he was... <laughs> the whole time they, yeah. were against, they, were, they were together, wasn't he? <laughs> yeah. As oh, as, yeah. As soon as, as soon as he's gone, okay. Yeah. We can use this now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, he he did he did drastically cut back taxes. I'll, I'll give him that. Um, and he, I think he almost balanced the budget. You know, he he did significantly reduce the debt. A um, lot lot of bad federalist laws did go away, but you know, he he never went full fledged of of his own um, ideals. You know, he he never. One of the places where he really dropped the ball was. Uh, Supreme Court. He appointed some Supreme Court justices that weren't terribly good. Um, the Embargo Act of uh, what was it, 1807, where basically his response to tensions with France, I think it was at the time, maybe it was Britain, I forget which, his response was basically, well, the United States is not going to trade with anybody. And so he ordered, you know, it was illegal for American ships to depart for any foreign ports. And he gave customs officials all kinds of additional taxes, or sorry, powers to, uh, you know, search ships and and uh, inspect manifests. In other words, very very so similar he to embargoed like embargoed the U.S. from the entire world. Or at least he tried to. I mean, yeah, that's impossible. Yeah, wow. <laughs> yeah. And, and New England actually talked a lot about seceding from the Union during Jefferson's presidency because of all these things, which is kind of interesting because yes. everyone thinks secession is just a kooky thing Southerners came up with. You know, one day no. for no reason. No, Thoreau was really big on it too. Well, no, that's that's that's. that's it's funny that you said that because that is one of the things. You know, for 
because one of the one of the documents that I, I look to as a, you know a positive from Jefferson was what was which one did he write? It was the the Virginia and the Kentucky resolutions. He uh, wrote one. The, the Kentucky one. He was wrote, he was a Kentucky. Yeah, he was like, you know, and him and Madison both basically talked about nullification without actually they never actually used the word right. I think that's how it went. But they basically that they danced around it the whole time. And secession is naturally tied to that. And you know they that's the, that's the thing they talk about this stuff in one instance and then when they when they get the chance to have the quote unquote power it's like no no we're just gonna let things keep going <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah well, you know, that that's how it I didn't really is. mean that I didn't really mean that that was that was just me that, that that's that's stuff. part of the uh, why I say America at its founding was kind of a proto oligarchy like very few small people had control of the government and. They tricked people into thinking that they were the people and all this. And you look at the actions of every president after the, even the first one, they're just completely out of control. Compl like they wiped the ass with the Constitution. <laughs> yeah, that's, and, un and, that's unconstitutional, Dave. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and probably one of the worst things we could lay at, at Jefferson as president is that he really began this precedent of when a new president and a new party takes over promising real serious change right that that change never quite happens anywhere near to what was promised you know even if there is a little bit of change it never lives up to it and so in a way he he like began that tradition that runs all the way through to the present and you know through people like reagan talking about government is the problem and then government grew for eight years under him yeah. You know, all this sort of thing. Yeah, Reagan's great for quotes, but for action, uh, not so much. Yeah, yeah. pretty much. Uh, and he's still so revered by so many on the right. It's just so sad. Yeah. Uh. We need another <laughs> Reagan revolution, dude. Right. Yeah, and that, that was why I, it was like one of my first, I don't know, five or ten episodes. I did a Reagan episode just to throw out, you know, uh, some, of, some of the okay. things on him, some of the, the specs, the numbers of like, Okay, he he gave all these great speeches. What actually happened to Leviathan over those eight years? Oh, wait, it actually grew faster than it did under that liberal Jimmy Carter. Yeah, that was shocked to hear that. I, I was really, I sent that episode to one of my friends who was a huge, uh, you know, man, we just need another Reagan and all this. And I sent it to him, and he was like, "Wow, <laughs> that's all." He, he sent me back one word, "Wow." <laughs> so, um, but you know, like. Uh, so much of the industry was tied into the government and how it was controlled. It was never, people have this sense that America was a free market from the get go, and that's just simply not true. Yeah, no, it's it's never been true. I mean, now has has it been, you know, more free or less free at various times? Uh, sure, but it, it's never been a pure free market. You know, any any time you've got the state messing around with money and banking and tariffs and all these sorts of things. I mean, you, you, you can't call that a free market because all those sorts of things are going to cause distortions and, you know, misallocations within the economy. All those sorts of things are going to cause uh, opportunity for special interests to, you know, milk the state for money. I mean, George Washington was basically doing it for the sake of his real estate portfolio while he was president. He did a whole bunch of different things that, you know, basically caused his real estate uh, uh, net worth to, to spike. So, you know, it's it's an old game. It's just gotten a lot more blatant and a lot more larger scale, but it's always been there. All right. So statism is, you know, is grounded in fear, you know, and you were, you know, you, you were talking about, you know, you know, past presidents and and the things that they did and and how people have to, you know, they have to be indoctrinated to understand or, or to uh, to accept these things. Right. Because I think, um, you know, as you said before, you know, I think we're all born anarchists and un understanding some basic morality, you know, certain things are going to be taught, but understanding basic morality and just and then in school, you got to you kind of got to they have to warp and distort your mind so you understand, you know, it's it's bad to steal, but taxation is good. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's bad to to make money in your basement, but if the Federal Reserve does it, it's it's currency creation, right? Increasing the money supply. So, so you have to uh, they have to you know you know reshape your brain and uh, and and I guess yeah, the the process of learning about this history is is undoing all that you know just all those distortions, right? And <laughs> that's why it's great what, what you do, you know. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's one of those things where. 
um, I don't think it's the only thread that can lead you to questioning everything, but I think history is probably one of the most obvious threads and, and one of the ones where, you know, it really does eventually, it, if you have the courage and fortitude to, you know, not just let your confirmation bias screen out anything that doesn't fit with what you want, if, if you kind of are willing to surrender to what actually is true, I think eventually you do end up falling down that rabbit hole kind of where we're at. But it's a fun rabbit hole. Yeah, it, it doesn't it doesn't take much. All it takes is a few for that that's that's why our show's called the Seeds of Liberty. All it takes is for that little bit of a seed to get planted and it might take 6 10 months, but then something happens where you're just like, "Wait a second. Yeah, I mean, well, I, I spent everything's years wrong. as a conservatarian, so you know, I, I spent years in that limbo of, you know, was there a book or, or something that just was like, wow, blew, like for me it was For a New Liberty by Murray Rothbard. You know, I, I can't think of a specific book. I, it was such a gradual thing. Um, I think in 08, and, and this is one thing I will give Ron Paul credit for, is I think he was a great gateway drug for a ton of people, uh, yeah. myself included, you know, mm -hmm. um, because it was kind of getting into the Ron Paul thing in 08, and then from there, you know, from all the websites that were supporting him, you start getting linked to articles by Rothbard and, you know, all these other great people. And, and at first, you know, man, the first time I read Rothbard, I was like, what the hell? <laughs> and, and then, you know, I, I had to, like, have that sit down with myself kind of time of like, mm -hmm. okay, wait a minute. This actually seems to make perfect sense. Why am I having, like, an emotional... <laughs> defensive reaction against this you know it, and, I, and I, I almost felt like it was just a matter of submission it was a matter of just like okay uh, I'm no longer going to resist you know what actually makes sense here <laughs> I'm going to drop my constitution and my flag I'm going to face <laughs> facts <laughs> yeah yeah let, let me ask you uh, CJ um, if, if you were to talk to somebody you know about the importance of learning true history and then they were to say well, well how does that impact my life like like I'm just trying to make money, just trying to feed my family. What do I care about history? What, why should I study this stuff? What would you say to somebody like that? Yeah, that, that is a great question, and that's the sort of thing that most students who don't want to be in history class will throw you know, that up just like they do at calculus of, hey, this means nothing to my life or whatever. But mm -hmm. the thing about history is that I think it actually does have way more relevance to all of our lives than calculus does, assuming we're not rocket scientists or something. <laughs> and I, I think what it is is, you know, people say, like, we, right off the bat collectivist, we mm -hmm. have to learn history so we can avoid the same mistakes, whatever. But that, that's not true because we are not going to be the kings and the presidents and the prime ministers. You know, um, by definition, anyone who wants to learn important lessons from history uh, in terms of like, you know, right and wrong and what's true and what's false is never going to be a president of anything. It's just not going to happen. So you're going to keep getting the same people that are either the same types of people that are either stupid, evil or stupid and evil, always ending up in charge like clockwork. So I, I, I don't give the answer of we got to learn from the mistakes of the past, except insofar as. I just, you know, assume that stupid and evil people are always going to tend to end up in charge. They're always going to tend to do stupid and evil things. I can't really change that right now. You know, I, I can't, like, call up a president and, and just really persuade him to not do stupid, evil stuff. <laughs> but what I can do is, number one, I, I cannot waste my time and my energy, you know, getting sucked into their bullshit. And then also... I can learn from the disasters that have happened in the past almost as like a way of self-defense. You know, understand the kinds of stupid and evil things the people in charge will do. And then, well, I can't stop them from doing it, but how can I try to at least protect myself and my family from like, you know, the worst um, uh, side effects of the stupid and evil things they're likely to do? It's very hard. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, so, that's that, that's kind of my answer there. Yeah, and uh, knowledge is power. <laughs> it is. Yeah, stupid and evil things. I guess that would be the Democrats and Republicans. What, what did you say the other day, Danilo? It's a inepto ineptocracy or something. 
Um, no, it, it, idiocracy. Oh, idiocracy. Yeah, like, oh, yeah. Like, like rule by rule by the dumb, rule by the stupid, rule by the the least uh, intellectually capable. Um, because you know the people who are intelligent and are creative and are imaginative do not want to rule people. <laughs> they just want to create things and make life make life better for everyone else, right? They don't want to. Why do you? Why would you want to control people? You know, it's actually it kind of reminds me. Um, Recently, I uh, I talked with a, a woman I, I never met before. I just was on the beach with my wife in Long Island, and I met this woman. She's in her 60s, and she was telling me in her 10th or or sorry, maybe 20th high school reunion, 20th year high school reunion, she said the people in when she was in high school, like you know the um, the guys who were like skinny, scrawny, you know, and unpopular, nerdy. Those are the guys that you know 20 years looked awesome, lean, you know, fit, muscular, just like you know, really looked good. And then it was the 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 guys that were jocks and you know. And uh, bullies and you know just idiots. Um, they were the you know the <laughs> overweight, you know beer belly and just bald and just they just looked horrible. And another thing is the the, the people who were the bullies um, in high school tended to be um, law enforcement. And and another girl who really um, pissed her off and was bully, she became border patrol. <laughs> so I think to, to me that really illustrates what kind of personality. Is draw you know is drawn to positions of power, right? You know, power over other people. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, there definitely is a self-selection there for basically you know psychopath and sociopath type personality traits, you know, that become uh, politicians and and that sort of thing. I mean, and, and the handful who go into that who who actually aren't kind of that way. Um, they either quickly drop out of it once they see what it's really like on the inside or they get corrupted, you know, they go into it as decent, well-intentioned people and then very quickly they get so corrupted that they just, you know, become a full-fledged part of the system. I make the case frequently that, you know, even if, even if some people um, are not necessarily evil and wicked minded, you know, evil intentions, even if they have good intentions and they are gen, you know, genuinely trying to help people, there is no way that you can pass laws, mandates, mandates and edicts with threats of punishment over millions of people and not have harmful effects on, on, on the, the lives and the peaceful interactions between millions of people and the billions of interactions between millions of people. There is no way that you can do that without having harmful effects. So to me, it doesn't even re it doesn't even rem remotely matter what their intentions are. Their effects will always be damaging, right? Because oh, you sure. cannot predict the millions of interactions that occur. And well, you can't, it's, you know, it's, it's like the the getaway driver. You know, he's he's not. You know, he's only as helping. You know, he may not run into the place with a gun, but he's driving them away. So, mm. you know, he's he's you know he's not as bad as them. So it's the facilitators. You know that it's like. The accomplices of evil that don't really think that they're doing evil, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's it's the guys who um, you know did auto maintenance for the SS hmm. so that they could get successfully to where they were going. I guess you know they're not actually killing anybody, but they are kind of contributing to the whole mess. So what we we've kind of talked about early American. You know, we had first few presidents were just crazy, crazy, crazy. Like everyone likes to put them on a pedestal, but they were. You know, Washington, you had the Whiskey Rebellion, and Washington was a complete fascist. Um, was Betrayed his own troops and stuff to get more land. All this other stuff. Just a horrible person. You know, and then you have uh, Adams and, and Jefferson. They were terrible as well. The Alien Sedition Act. Buying all the Louisiana Persian. Completely operating outside of the, uh, the United States Constitution that they so, you know, violently fought for. And uh, it just, just, it just insane like how it went from that to you know the Rockefellers and the the um, you know the the uh, JP Morgans of the world right. just took over everything in American life and, and are really are the ones pulling the strings uh, uh, that same type of people that you just look at JP Morgan for instance that's it. there's like 20,000 JP Morgans now and they're all pulling the strings and they're all bending the state to do what they want. Like, my one of my favorite quotes is, uh, "If you think your vote matters as much as David Rockefeller's, please check yourself." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. Well, there was the big battle for for so much of the 19th century over money and banking. That you know, 
it was kind of back and forth for a long time. You know, the the banksters would win a couple victories and then they'd get pushed back. You know, everybody, uh, a lot of libertarians like to kind of overdo it on Andrew Jackson as far as positivity there. I mean, mm. I'll definitely give him credit for opposing the um, the National Bank, but on the other hand, what he did with the government's money was to put it in state banks that were, you know, as bad if not worse. And uh, aside from the fact that he was ethnically cleansing Indians the whole time, you know, mm -hmm. um, not exactly a, a, a real libertarian thing to ethnically cleanse thousands and thousands of Indians. No, he um, was definitely uh, a horrible uh, uh, person. Uh, yeah, it's a, nice, it's a nice euphemism, ethnic cleansing. I like that. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. And the other thing, J.P. Morgan, you know, one of my favorite quotes of his is, um, uh, "Gold is money; everything else is credit." <laughs> you know, studying the creature from Jekyll Island, you know, learning about the history of the Federal Reserve and and uh, you know how that came about, and uh, it's just it's it's really really uh, fascinating when you discover that that and and that's another thing that so many people know absolutely nothing about. You know, nothing. Where does money come from? Something they use on a daily basis. They just don't care. You know, and you know that's why I love using the dollar bill as a lesson you know what all the writing on the dollar bill means like right what is the note what is the federal reserve what what is it you know is what is what is the definition of a dollar you know the dollar used to be you know certain certain um used to be defined in gold it's weight in gold right yeah. <laughs> and it's no longer relevant it's just an iou it's a contract it's a it's a debt note <laughs> so yeah. do you think it was mainly under woodrow wilson where th america just kind of fully flopped over to economic fascism as their as their policies or was it more under FDR it's it's so hard to 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 pinpoint because it really was like a cumulative process you know you could go all the way back um even to well you could go all the way back to like the first bank of the united states in a way if you wanted to but you could go back to um the lincoln administration and, you know, everybody, of course, knows about the war, but very few people know about how much corporate welfare uh, the Lincoln administration was doing. Um, very few people know about things like the National Banking Acts that were passed under Lincoln that, you know, if they were named honestly, they would have been called the um, Further Empower and Privilege Wall Street Acts. <laughs> you know, yeah. just give, giving those, those sorts of guys... Um, it didn't bring back like formally a national bank, but it basically did in in a form of like a collective of several Wall Street banks that were given special powers and privileges to collectively almost sort of be a central bank. Um, you know, and, and then all the all the war as a racket type stuff was already going on, you know, back then even. It didn't it didn't start with World War One, you know. So there there was war as a racket type uh, corporatism going on in, in the not so civil war, and um, it, but yeah, definitely that that progressive era, not not just Wilson's administration in itself, but like the whole sort of 1900 to 1920. I, I would definitely agree that that's when like a lot of key uh, pieces of the structure were put in place. You know, from the the income tax to the Federal Reserve, to you know a lot of the stuff that happened even under uh, Teddy Roosevelt as far as is increased regulations of, of business, which basically means government and business joining forces. Um, and then, of course, World War I. And, you know, as, as I'm sure you guys probably all, all know, I'm sure you're probably all familiar with Robert Higgs' book, Crisis and Leviathan, mm -hmm. uh, which is you a know, great book. And, and that spells out how war is this wonderful opportunity every time they want to get a lot of big, you know, changes implemented. War is the golden ticket for that. Yeah, just look at the war on terror. That's, that's all you need to do. Look yeah, at how much America has changed since 2001. It's insane. Yeah, that, that's why they love they love war metaphors. They love war rhetoric. You know, because people are conditioned to think that in war all the restrictions are off the table on power, you know. Well, yeah, the war is the health of the state. That that I didn't understand that when I first heard it, you know. You know, 15 years ago but now I understand that because the thing is under the pretext of war government can do whatever it wants because people are just clamoring for safety yeah yeah it, it gives them an opportunity that you know even economic depressions do not I mean FDR did far more growing of the Leviathan during World War II than he did during the New Deal in the 30s oh yeah for sure increased the amount of 
uh, Supreme Court justices, <laughs> all kinds of stuff. He was a very nasty man. Yeah. Jeremy, you haven't talked in a while. Has you got anything to say? I'm just absorbing all the knowledge. From... <laughs> no, Actually, uh, I, I, well, we got all these ladies out here that listen to the show, and they just love your voice. So it's. Yeah. Um, we have the babes. The, the babes' uh, Facebook page is uh, swooning over Jeremy's voice. So. So, yeah. That, yeah. Sort of that's... the uh, Caucasian Barry White. <laughs> that's uh, that, that's your that's your bag, to know. They, they love you <laughs> over there. Um, no, I mean it's. It's funny because you, you, I'm glad that you, you know, brought Teddy Roosevelt into that because that's he's he's another one that often gets left off a lot of people's radars. And I'm somebody I live on Long Island where he is like, you know, revered here. Um, and uh, my grandmother growing up used to regale me of tale like she was, you know, she was a little kid, but you know, even uh, she was born after his presidency, and she still like, you know, talked about how wonderful he was and um, he could have done no wrong. And that guy, I mean, he was the original. Well, maybe not the original, but he was, you know, the imperialist, the one who's stomping all over the world trying to take over everything. And uh, one of my favorite quotes I ever read about him was, was I mean, it, it's, you know, with, with history, this is so many times it's hard to uh, find out what's real and what's not. But I've seen it in a bunch of different places that it was actually one of his inner circle um, was quoted as referring to him as a perpetual six year old. Yeah. Because that's what he was. He was just he was on an adventure at all times. But he's looked upon by so many as this great man who, you know, the whole, you know, walk softly, carry a big stick BS. Um, but he was. He was just like a big kid who just wanted to take, he just wanted everything to be his. <laughs> Which, you, you know, in, in a way, if, if there was no state for him to go, you know, work his way up and get in charge of, um, he might have been an interesting guy and a cool guy to hang out with, you know, because... Yeah. He was an interesting dude. He he was, you know, obviously a smart guy, did a lot of stuff, traveled all over the world, you know, was into all kinds of different, you know, everything from from martial arts to to science and I mean, you know, really was kind of a cool dude if you just completely delete the whole, you know, <laughs> politics aspect of his yeah. life, you know, right? Imper the imperialist, imperialist aspect. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Insane. Yeah. So, you know, he, he's Blood a lust. guy that if if he had been, you know, lucky enough to be born in the future in Libertopia or whatever, um, he might have just been a cool dude, right? But, you know, with the state there and, and waiting to be used by somebody like him, uh, you know, we see what happens. How how were the Roosevelt so politically powerful and dominant and, and so pertinent to I've never really looked into it, but like how were they such a family, so to say? Like were they part of some kind of you know fascistic empire <laughs> you know well, like, you know they they were kind of um sort of they weren't in skull and bones they were not yale guys they were harvard guys but they were kind of like skull and bones types in a way um they they were members of there's there's a society at harvard that's actually some people think it's even more important than skull and bones but it's way less well known than Skull and Bones, and I'm blanking out on the name. Um, the name of the club actually has something to do with with pigs, believe it or not. Um, uh, I think it's oh, like the 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 pork por porkillion club or porcillion club, or I don't know how you say por it. Portillion. Yeah, it's, it starts with P O R C. Um, and and honestly, this is this is a club that's been on my list of things to investigate more for a long time. I just haven't gotten around to it. But I've come across Be obscure careful. references. Yeah. Oh yeah. Right. That's look out for black podcast helicopters. Episode on that. Yeah. If I ever do a podcast episode on that, I'll be expecting a drone within forty-eight hours. But, uh, <laughs> you know, every, everybody knows Skull and Bones, um, or at least you know, kind of vaguely knows what it is. But this other club in Harvard, I've run across obscure references to it, where some people swear it's it's like more powerful and, and more important than Skull and Bones, and I. Think I think both of the Roosevelts who were presidents were um, members of that when they were at Harvard. Hmm. So they are kind of like this old-timey, blue blood. You know, the Roosevelt family had been in New York since the 1600s. Um, they were, you know, friends with a lot of people who were even wealthier than they were, which is always a key to political power. It's the same thing with the Bushes. You know, the Bushes are wealthy, but they're not like super duper top, you know, level wealthy. But they're friends with lots of people who are, you know. So they're sort of like the gophers <laughs> for the J.P. Morgan types, you know. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, who was it? Was, was it Preston? Was the was he the one that was uh... Prescott? Prescott, Prescott was the one that was hooked up with the. Uh, you should. Uh, he should be a dangerous history enemy. <laughs> or, 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 or um, he... yeah, yeah, yeah. He he might. Um, I actually, when I um in in my classes when I do U.S. history two, I actually have my students read War is a Racket, um, and then we have like a you know hour long discussion about War is a Racket. And then after we have a discussion of War is a Racket, I actually go through a brief sketch of the Bush family in the early 20th century as like a case study of the early military industrial complex. And um, I talk about, you know, Samuel Prescott Bush, during World War I, he was the head of Buckeye Steel, which mm -hmm. was a Rockefeller connected uh, steel company that also was a main supplier of steel to Remington Arms. And then during World War I, obviously Remington Arms is cranking out a crap load more rifles than they normally would for deer hunters. And then um, while still running Buckeye Steel, Samuel Prescott Bush gets brought into the War Industries Board to run the small arms department of the War Industries Board. Doesn't even resign running Buckeye Steel. Hmm. So, you know, just the most blatant conflict of interest stuff. <laughs> and, um, and my, my students are flabbergasted because they, they don't know anything about the Bushes other than, you know, W, uh, you know, pretending to be a Southern Christian and all this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So Prescott was part of the government and a CEO of a steelmaking company. Uh, Sam, Samuel Prescott. Yeah. Prescott was his son. Okay. Um, Sam Prescott yeah. was significantly more evil, <laughs> in my opinion. Yeah. Prescott was the one who was a senator from Connecticut for a while. Mm. Yes. Well, wasn't was wasn't one about. of them f giving jet fuel to the Nazis? Uh, yeah, that that one I I believe, I'm not familiar with that specific case, but that I believe that would have been Prescott, um, Those... because he he was connected to what was it the, uh, I G uh, Farben. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I can't remember the Ameri the American financial company that oh. he was at that was connected to them, and the company got prosecuted under the Trading with the Enemies Act, but none of the guys running the company ever got in in trouble personally oh yeah of course what is it at&t gets f uh, uh fined 800 million for screwing over their people guess who gets that 800 million not right. the customers the government sure yeah. sure well we we are the people so we'll just take that money and <laughs> yeah right oh me so CJ, um, you, you touched on uh, Teddy Roosevelt, and, uh, and Jeremy was saying how much he's revered over here, and definitely by my family, I know, because I come from a, a line of Democrats, and, uh, and so my, my grandfather, he's always, always sending me information, or like, it's like .gov websites on history <laughs> yeah. of, uh, on, on, uh, on Rose Teddy, Teddy Roosevelt, and about, you know, especially the antitrust. I mean, that's the big thing. He's like, how can you hate this guy? He broke up the monopolies. You know, how can we live without, you know, the government? That, look at what the awesomeness that they're doing, breaking out these evil monopolies. So can you just touch on that and just because uh, uh, <laughs> I'd like to hear that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and this is something um, it's been a while since I dug into all the nitty gritty uh, details of some of these suits and whatever. But basically what, what I found when I did dig into this was, you know, you had this law, the Sherman Antitrust Act. That had been on the books already for like I don't know 15 years or so when Teddy Roosevelt became president and hardly anybody had done anything with that law it had mostly been just sitting there only used a few times um, not in any big way it was a law that was written extremely vaguely which of course presidents love of course because yeah because then they can just selectively interpret it to mean whatever the hell they want it to mean right and and so Teddy Roosevelt comes in and he like picks up this law that had been lying dormant forever and he, he goes out and he clobbers a few companies with it and uh, he, he's famous for making this distinction Teddy Roosevelt saying well there are good trusts and there are bad trusts right um, you know a, a big business a trust isn't bad just because it's big um, it's bad if it's big and, and also you know behaving badly or whatever but when you look into like the companies that he identified as good trusts and said oh we shouldn't you know investigate them or or, or go after them uh, and then the companies he he identified as bad trusts and and thus were the ones he's going to go in and try and you know clean up or break up or whatever you find that 
the, the companies that he went after were all companies that were, you know, politically not supportive of him. And the companies that he said are, oh, these are good companies, we shouldn't bother them, coincidentally <laughs> happened to be companies run by guys who were his main, you know, supporters and financiers and whatever. So stop, stop, stop digging, that's just a coincidence, come on. <laughs> right, right, yeah, yeah. So, you know, it's, it's like if you had a, um, I don't know, let's, let's, let's put it on a micro level because people are always more willing to see and accept corruption um, and even conspiracy at a local level than at a big level. Mm. Let's say you had a, um, a city that was horribly corrupt and you had two contending crime families that were just constantly fighting for control of the city. And you get a new chief of police and he says, well, I'm a reformer, right? I'm going to clean this place up. I'm going to end all this corruption and crime. And he comes in and he does start making some serious busts. But he's only ever busting members of one of the two gangs. Mm -hmm. He's never, but you know, he's only busting guys from crime family A. He's never really busting anybody from crime family B, mm -hmm. right? And furthermore, you look into like who are his, you know, associates and the people he's appointing under him and so on, and you find out, oh look, they're all like friends and cousins and high school roommates and stuff of the guys <laughs> in the gang that he's never going after. Like after a while. You know, most people would say, okay, clearly that chief of police is on the side of one of the gangs. He's mm -hmm. not trying to end the crime. He's just trying to help one gang against another. And, and that's essentially what I think Teddy Roosevelt was doing. In that's regards what every to president has done. Oh, sure, sure. <laughs> that's what every but, political person does. I mean, that's, that's, you just wrapped up politics in a nutshell. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I've, I often said that, you know, one of the most uh, uh, helpful movies to watch to understand politics is go watch the Godfather series. <laughs> um, or, or maybe I, Game of Thrones, right? Um, yeah. Game of Thrones, the Godfather, House of Cards, these are a hell of a lot closer to the reality of government and politics than the West Wing. Yeah, I only watch the West Wing, man. The West Wing and Independence Day, that, that, th those are the best presidents, man. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, that's. Yeah. I mean, it's funny because I mean, I, I, at least from my understanding, the you know the reason that you know Roosevelt was the one to pick that up and and run with it, and the reason it had been lying dormant is because those evil monopolies that people are 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 told to fear didn't actually exist. You know, that's another part of history that's kind of been like, you know, along with some stuff like the quote unquote wild wild west. These things have been distorted so people believe that oh the the, the you know the Sher the Sherman Act that had to be done because of these monopolies. Well no they, they really weren't the problem. You know, it's it's when the government gets involved and helps create the monopolies <laughs> that's when the problem happens. And that's what the Sherman Trust Act actually that's what it ended up to, that's what it ended up doing. It's another one of those laws that's purported to stop something but it actually helps create it instead. What what do I, what do I still have my open challenge? No one's been able to beat it yet? Which show me, show me one monopolized service that hasn't used some form of go government for force, or one monopoly throughout history that has not used some form of government force to at attain that that level of power. Well, it's true. impossible. You can't. And, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, you might be able to find an example of a company that briefly has a monopoly just because they were the first to come up with something, but. Yes. There, there's no such thing as a monopoly in, in a in a free market scenario. A monopoly that endures for a long length of time that that just doesn't happen. Yeah, well, yeah, we're not talking about like a regionalized monopoly. Like if I live out in the middle of the desert and I have one cow, and there's only one cow in the next million miles, uh, I have a monopoly on cows for this area, right? So yeah. we're even not that's talking only about temporary. Yeah, even that is only temporary. That yeah, that cow's gonna it's, die. It's, well, no, until your neighbor decides to, buy, to finds a way to buy two, and then you no longer have right. the monopoly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, but um, or you know, there's an oasis out in the middle of the desert, and it's the only oasis, and I own it. I I can protect it. You know, I have a monopoly on that water. So, um, but that even that won't last. Uh, so, we have this thing where there's no way like government allows monopolies. Like the antitrust is a dog and pony show. You know. Uh, Rockefeller got more rich when they broke up his company. It's just, just all. It's all a farce. It's all a game. Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing I was gonna say is, um, even even the you know the purported evil um, corporations or businesses at that time that were considered those huge monopolies um, were actually 
or, or gain such wealth and prominence by pleasing the customer, <laughs> right? And uh, I forget who it was. Was it Vanderbilt uh, that that had his uh, the railroad, um, and he was able to to outdo his competitor who had government like subsidies, and Vanderbilt did not have government subsidies, and he well, was Vanderbilt to... had government subsidies as well. Well. Well, well, maybe, maybe, but maybe like a lot less than this yeah. other guy, and he was able to offer his his uh, his um, his passengers like train rides, you know, free food and much cheaper fare, and oh, you know, yeah, all, yeah. This, that, all these things. Was that was that Vanderbilt? I think it it, it was Vanderbilt, but um, the case you're thinking of, it wasn't it wasn't railroads. It was actually steamboat service. Right, yes. right, right. On, Sorry, on the right. Hudson River. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. The, but the basic scenario is absolutely right. Yeah, he yes. did, he didn't have a monopoly on on our. He he totally used government force with his with his railroads. Totally, like he yeah. would go into a a state or whatever, tell the governor, "I'll build my train tracks here. If anyone else builds them, I'm shutting them down, and you know I'm gonna fuck the other person up." Basically, like uh, he would get oh. these special land deals with 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 governments and and stuff. So he was totally using government to achieve his ends. Yeah, there was there was one um, basically free market railroad guy out west, and yeah. that that was James J. Hill with the mm -hmm. Great Northern Railroad that went from yes. I think it was St. Paul to Seattle. Yes, and he was the only one, at least out west anyway. Th there were some fairly private railroads built in the east, but out west most of it was you know subsidized welfare queen uh, companies. But James J. Hill built his railroad without any subsidies, as far as I know. And it was the best railroad out west. It was the best built, the best run. You know, it, it, it never needed a bailout from anybody. And, and not only that, but, like, because he wasn't playing the politics game, when he ran into problems with the local Indians, he actually had to negotiate with them. He actually had to make deals with them to build through their land. He couldn't just cable back to D.C. and say, hey, send me some, uh, you know, some cavalry out here to clear out these savages. So, you know, it, it's a case of, you know, everybody says that, that uh, the free market is inherently, you know, exploitative and violent and whatever. But, you know, the company that was more free market is the one doing business with the Indians. The companies that are political are the ones just bringing in the troops every time there's a problem. I don't understand how socialism gets so convoluted. Like, I don't know how free market gets such a bad rap. I just never same, have understood it. Same, same as anything else, propaganda. And they and, so get and a, and free market confused with fascism. It, it blows my mind. Well, that's, that's, I think that's done by design. But I, the, the, you know, the, the story about Hills Railroad, I, I love that story. That was, that was another one I came across early on that when I started studying economics that it was like, you know, you learn, you know, it's like, oh, the, the, if it wasn't for government, we wouldn't have had these things. Well, no, he was doing it, as you know, as, as you said, as you said, CJ, you know, with no subsidies. And from what, from what from, I remember, what I remember reading on it, he had to, he offered all these great services because he took the time to find the best routes and do right. everything. And, and, the, and the people that were competing with him at the time who had the subsidies and should have been able to blow him out of the water were doing like, um, they were doing like they were going out of the way purposely and doing like double loops so they could because they were getting paid you know they would get extra money for every track they had to, every every oh. every you know uh, piece of track they had to lay so they were purposely going out out of their way and uh looping back and forth in certain places and like almost doubling <laughs> up the tracks so they could get more money and hill ended up finishing i think i, th I think the story when he finished ahead of their schedule because he just plotted along and didn't do didn't do because he couldn't it was his money he yeah. had no subsidies, and or he had some investors, but it was like he was beholden to them. He didn't have literally free money being thrown at him, and that's that is the free market in action. You know, people that are willing to put their own money or find people to in, that will invest in them and put it up, they have to answer to those people. So they have a vested interest in putting the best possible product at the most competitive prices, so that they can succeed and stay in business. And the people that get subsidized will forever twiddle their thumbs because why not they're getting paid for it anyway and often a lot more than the other guy is and they can you know basically jack off and still collect the paycheck and if everything goes to hell well they'll just run back to government and get some more help in another matter <laughs> we're yeah. too big to fail yeah and, and, and just for the for the listeners the the book that has that story and also the story of the um the steamboats on the, on the hudson river where there was a 
uh, a government um, state of New York sanctioned monopoly there, and then Vanderbilt came in and outcompeted them. Uh, that the that book, if you want to look that up, is the Myth of the Robber Barons yes. Uh, yes. by Burton yes. Folsom. Great, great little yes. book. I've got to read it now. I <laughs> yeah. read it so and it's not even very long. It's like 150 pages or something. So we, yeah, we've not... we've talked about late 1900s, early 2000s, or not 2000s, late 1800s, early 1900s, kind of the the robber baron era where you know you have these families collecting vast amounts of wealth through governmental means and uh, where do you see america in 10 years as far as do you see it a decline in this this kind of thing happen because i, I feel like technology is kind of destroying a government's ability to prop these people up uh you know for instance mark zuckerberg should not be well i mean he has used government for a lot of his money but uh his initial rise that doesn't happen, you know, that that happens very rarely, you know, like uh, John Rockefeller is one of the, the shining examples of this, you know, here's a guy who should not have been the richest man in the world and became the richest man in the world. Um, but then once he got up there, he used that money to be protectionist. Yeah. Do we, are you, do you see like technology phasing that ability out? Um, the the ability of people to kind of protect their their position using the state is that what you mean uh, yes uh to use corporatism to use you know uh, i i, I kind of just get sick of people's you know you know uninformed people saying oh it's those greedy capitalist bankers uh, you know the bankers aren't capitalists you know banking that has any state if the state does one thing in in banking, it now is not capitalist. I, right. I, I have a hard time talking to, especially socialists that don't really understand economic terms, and I tell them, look, you have capitalism here, right? And the minute government does anything, think of a big swimming pool, and that swimming pool is capitalism, and government tips its little bitty bitty toe in, <laughs> that whole pool is now fascist. <laughs> yeah, like, or, 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 or take some piss in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, yeah, yeah. was going to say that. That's a better analogy. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Or takes a piss in it, you know. So that that, that you can't. That you can you take can the toe. Not... You can take the toe out. You just you can't. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, the pee is in there forever. Right. So like the pull, like once there's a one percent tax on any part of the market, it's now a that's corporatist because it's gonna then you're gonna regulate it. And, you know, then the government's going to be so tied into the economy that they're going to have to, they're going to want a centralized bank to control currency. So that's, to me, where America, it was this great dream, right, that we, we could have the free market and the government goes and does this little thing and no one ever knows it. And then it just grew and grew and grew and grew. The P, more, government kept P and more in the pool. So right. I, I, I don't know what we can do to get the, 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 the P out. <laughs> I, 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 just drain it. Just drain it. I think we have just, to drain it. Dude, just, just abandon the pool. Just abandon they, the pool, man. Just yeah, walk yeah, away. Yeah. Go, go, go find a, a nice, pools. pretty. Uh, go find a nice, pretty lake or river or something to swim in. It's more free anyway. Exactly. Yeah. Pool, pools are too confining. Pools are status. <laughs> pools are status. Pools are status. That's a new T-shirt right there. Yeah. Pools are for control freaks that want everything nice and safe and boring. <laughs> you know, if you, right. if you you want to experience freedom, go swim around in the ocean. You know, go go play tag with the sharks and the stingrays and all that. Just make sure you wear some pants. You know, they see that little thing dangling. It oh, wow, it's gone. Yes, pants. Yes, pants are Chainmail pants. Chainmail <laughs> pants. No shark bait for this. You know, but yeah, you know, like uh, what the economics seem, especially with T TPP coming. Obviously, this is more. And I know this word's probably been said a thousand times on the podcast so far. This is more fascistic control being thrusted upon corporations to control governments. And pretty soon it's going to be like, oh, no, no, no. We already have it now, but it's going to be become more blatantly clear that every government is just a puppet for the, the fascist. Yeah, yeah. I, the way I see it, and it's kind of the way I see history in a way all the time, but sometimes it's just more obvious than others is there's there's a race there's a race between you know freedom versus power and you have all these great things coming around you know all the stuff that you know 
a guy like Jeffrey Tucker, who's like almost always positive and upbeat. Mm. You know, he talks about it's a Jetsons world and all these wonderful things. And he's absolutely right about a lot of this stuff. I mean, you know, every now and then I have to just sit down and think like, isn't a freaking iPhone a miracle? Like, mm. I'm not that old, but I can remember where like a computer that filled up an entire room couldn't do 1% of what this iPhone does or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, if you and, would have told me I could video chat for free on a device I could hold in my hand with someone in China when I was like 10, I would have told you you were fucking nuts. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. When I was, uh, you know, a teenager and, and listening to the radio, if you, if you would have told me, you know, hey, in, in like, a, I don't know, 20 years or something, virtually for free, you can have your own talk show that everyone on earth potentially could listen to and that you didn't need to have anyone's okay to do it. I mean, the fact that you can start a podcast for like a couple hundred bucks counting everything to just get it up and running, you know, it might not be very good yet, but to get it, the basics up and running. Um, I mean, it's, that, that's a freaking miracle, right? Um, all, all these things provide great opportunities. The, the internet, you know, all these technologies really are game changers and it's just a question of like kind of who's going to be faster and smarter and, and a question of like can people who've got good ideas um, out compete in the marketplace of ideas out compete all those bad ideas now the bad ideas have the big guns the bad the bad ideas you know have have the corporate media um, they have the state behind them of course right um, and so that seems to give them all advantages, but, you know, I, I go back to the old um, kind of like David and Goliath story. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not religious, but I, but I think there's wisdom in, in some of these myths and stories and mm -hmm. things like that. And, um, you know, or like Malcolm Gladwell's book, David and Goliath. I don't know if, you've, if any of you guys have read that. It's a very interesting book. And, and on paper, you look at it and you go, well, Goliath's this huge freaking monster. He's just going to absolutely murder David, like, without breaking a sweat. And then it turns out, well, David's just not going to fight his fight, right? David's not going to get in close quarters and try and go hand-to-hand -hand or sword-to-sword -sword with Goliath. No, instead, he's going to play to what he's good at. He's going to stay back at a distance, clock Goliath with his slingshot, and then run in, or sling, and then run in and cut off his head while he's laying on the ground unconscious, you know? And, and, and so the way I look at things like um, podcasting, you know, all the new media stuff out there, all the alternative media stuff out there, is um, you know of which I'm I'm a, I'm a tiny part myself uh, for the past year is this it, it's David and Goliath and as long as David doesn't try to play Goliath's game David might win you know so uh, it kind of like guerrilla warfare too like you don't fight their war you know if you're fighting a guerrilla war you don't go and try and fight the enemy in lined up pitched open battles you know you you fight them sneaky you fight them smart you fight them in ways that are, that play to what you're good at. So it's just a question of who's going to win the race, the, the forces of liberty or the forces of, of power and control. And I don't know. I don't well, know see, that's why I was saying I think it's technology. I mean, you just look at uh, government schools versus how much I can learn on my iPad. Like, your entire history book at that school, I can pull it up on my iPad and I can have Siri read it to me. Yeah. So why, you know, like um, Gary Vaynerchuk, I don't know if you know who he is. He's like this huge, like social media advertising mogul kind of guy. Mm -hmm. He took his yeah, parents, he, he took his parents wine business, making like $2 million a year to making like $50 million a year. Um, he, he has this thing where um, his, and it's one of my favorite quotes of all time. He said, never in uh, human history is it now less important to be intelligent. Hmm. And he says, you know, it's like, uh, um, oh, wh who's the president of, or, you know, what's the capital of Uzbekistan? He goes, oh, I don't know, that. <laughs> so <laughs> it's like we're sending our kids to school to learn shit that is pointless. <laughs> because if they want to know, they can look right here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So if anything peaks in the, he's like, I don't care if my kids fail out of school and are F students as long as they learn how to use their intelligence in the real world. And I, I think that when you take that approach to 
the human condition it is is quite spectacular they try to compartmentalize and put everything in a box is this is how you're going to be a good american you're going to go to school then you're going to go to college then you're going to get a good job and then you're going to get a 401k and then you're going to die so it's like this whole like pre-planned thing and, and i think our generation i don't really really know how old you are i'm guessing you're below 35 um barely okay so uh it, it's this this our our generation is is pulling more towards a, i kind of want to do what i want to do thing it's like uh there's too much freedom has been injected into this into this uh this class of of of, of americans as i want to say is you you have the people that have grown up on welfare their whole life that's that's all they know but they still have way more freedom than than their parents or their parents before them had uh as far as just everyday life doing what they want um and uh I think technology is just gonna is no it's a tidal wave at this point, and and no government can control it. You're 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 seeing all these governments are just like, eh, we don't know what to do with Bitcoin. Just allow it. <laughs> they, they they you know I'm I'm guessing they're going in and saying, hey, can we stop this Bitcoin thing? And they're like, no, you can't. <laughs> well, they're still trying, but I I think. I, I think the you know the the race analogy that, that you made, CJ, is, is more is more accurate, um, because I, I've I, I've said for a while that yeah, technology is a wonderful thing, and it, it definitely can aid our our you know collective our, our collective you know cause, but it can also hurt us too. You know, it's it's kind of like technology has become like our great savior and and, and the greatest bane to our existence all at the same time because we have to fight that battle. We have to. We have to find people like us have to find ways to use it for the powers of you know good um, versus the people that want to use it to control us. Um, and it is, and you know, like you said, it's it's kind of hard to. T I mean, I would like to think that freedom will win in the end, but you know, we have a pretty bad track record right now. <laughs> you know, what is it, five thousand plus years of recorded history, all with some kind of version of the state <laughs> or the church or the church and state, you know, controlling people's lives. So that's a lot to go up against, and. Um, I mean, I, I don't know, Dave. I, I think in some but the, aspects, the, there wasn't the internet back then. We, I, I understand that, but that's why I was going to say. I think in some aspects, our generation or the, our generations are a little more free, but in other aspects, we're a lot less free. I mean, because you got to think about this now. We're, we're, there are now people that have, will grow up and have never lived life without the internet like all of us did. Well, I, I understand that. And that, that also, to me, I see that as a positive and a negative because, yeah, with, Van, you know, with Gary's You're just a Luddite. About, You're just a no, Luddite. I, no, I'm not a Luddite. I, I, <laughs> I, I think that, I think that it, it's great that you can have all this information at your fingertips, but it can also make a certain section of the population lazy mm. and more... Um, you know, more, more need, they, they need these things more and that, that can actually hamper people. You know, it's, you know, oh, yeah, I, believe there's me, people I, now I like that technology. are ranking internet above food. Well, it's, <laughs> like, again, it's like... for, for informational purposes, it's wonderful. But if you become too reliant on these things, you know, I'm somebody, I, you know, I, I like technology. It, it makes my life easier. Absolutely. I don't want to give those, there's certain things I would not want to give up, but I also started living my life uh, once I, you know, once I found uh, volunteerism and started headed down this path, I've also started living my life more preparing to live without it, just in case, in all aspects, you know, whether oh, it's course. whether you know, but even learning wise, because if you if if you get if everything's handed to you in that fashion, and this 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 these past couple of generations that are growing up, and that's all they know. Um, you know, for some people it may turn out great. For others, we just may end up with a whole new generation of drones, man, and that's no good. You know, that's why well, I don't like let my uh, I don't let my kids I don't let my well I don't let my kids use that stuff. My kids are almost four years old, and I don't let them use that type of technology. Where I see other parents doing it, and for short periods it's fine. But I've seen I know some parents that let their kids do it like all day long, and I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah, it's great that they can play with this stuff, but they they need to learn other skills. And if you don't do that, you're gonna. It, all, all this wonderful technology can totally backfire on you. Um, so I think yeah, yeah. there's a balance you got to strike. Sorry, go ahead, CJ. Uh, I was just going to say, um, yeah, and, and I agree with that, by the way. I, I've got two, two young kids myself, and, you know, I, I do, and I don't have to use a lot of, like, you know, kind of force or anything on it. Um, I've just in, instilled in my kids as much as I can a, a love of, you know, reading and, mm -hmm. and being out in nature and all that sort of stuff. And, like, 
you know, they, they have fun every now and then playing a video game or every now and then messing with an iPad for a little yeah. while, but, but I don't let it turn into, like, their day, right? Because um, that's, that's, I don't think that's good for anybody. But, uh, <laughs> you know, te technology, especially when it comes to any type of communications technology, um, it's always a two-way street as far as power goes because every, every advantage it gives to, to, you know, the cause of freedom also there's almost always like a like an equal and opposite reaction um thing it gives to the state so when the printing press first came out in europe it was like hey look at this you know average people maybe start to learn to read and and be able to afford books because they don't have to be handmade by monks or something and um and it was true you know that, that suddenly there was a lot more printed material available but then the state realized this and said okay um, now we need to make sure that we've got a handle on this and that we make sure that the printed material is approved by us and um, either directly or indirectly we control what books and newspapers and things get published and what don't. And then also, oh, we've we got to make sure we get our hand more in education because, you know, we want to make sure that these people are guided to think in the right way. If more of them are going to be literate and have access to printed material, it's important we get our hands on them very early to start steering them in the right direction. So in the Internet, same thing. It's got all this wonderful, um, you know, like liberation uh, uh, quality, but it also provides, um, you know, the ability to brainwash people kind of pretty effectively. Um, it also provides the ability of the NSA to surveil you more effectively. Um, you know, so so it it has its negatives, and so that that to me is why, I don't know. Like I I understand the all the positive aspects of technology. Um, I wouldn't have gone to the trouble of starting a podcast mm -hmm. if I didn't see that and, and believe that. But I I also see it as it's not a done deal. It's not a done deal. It's still. Oh no, there, there's going to be a fight. I agree. Yeah. Power doesn't give it up voluntarily. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and sometimes, you know, a big sick dinosaur in its death throes can cause a hell of a lot of damage, even if it's hmm. sick and dying. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that's are... what government is right now. It's well, a well, sick, gonna... dead dinosaur. <laughs> Those can actually be the most dangerous because they have absolutely nothing to lose at that point. <laughs> yeah, and they might not even be aware what it, what it is exactly they're doing. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I think, I think it was John Kerry that said um, the internet is making it harder to govern. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, you know, yeah, I think that's so true. Like, you know, when people say, um, um, they say to me, how can you believe what you read on the internet? You know, and, and to which I would say, well, how can you believe what you read, what you see on TV? <laughs> Does that yeah. mean you believe everything on the news? You know, so it, it, the internet is. You know, the reason, I mean, the, the fact that you find something on the internet does not mean it's true, right? You still have to employ no, 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 no. critical can, analysis and deductive no, no, no. reasoning. What? They can't put anything on the internet unless it's true. That's a law. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's a law. <laughs> right. I, saw, right, I so, saw that. that was, there's, there's a meme with uh, Lincoln. That was a Lincoln quote, right? That's yeah, yeah. Meme. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, no, no. Lincoln's best quote is anything, uh, anything can be a dildo if you're brave enough. <laughs> Right, so, <laughs> so, so, so I mean, I, right now, to me, the internet is anarchy. Is the sign? Is is the um, representation of spontaneous order? Right, it has no control. It it is not bound by any borders, you know, any barriers. It's it's really <laughs> pretty free. Um, however, it seems the net neutrality and TPP is attempting to rein that in, <laughs> that unbridled freedom. Oh yeah, in a million years, government couldn't have came up with Twitter. <laughs> in a million years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, and it's funny, you know, when you talk about the race uh, between freedom and power, it's um, it's like, um, I was trying to think of the proper analogy, and maybe I could think of a better one later, but for right now, the way I look at it is like, it's like a horse that's running really fast, and then somebody's just sitting on it, not doing anything. And then at the end of the race, the guy's like, well, you see, I won. <laughs> I right. did all the work. <laughs> no, actually, you didn't. Somebody else did the work. And you claimed, um, you know, how do you say, uh, you, you, you claimed just or, uh, you know, that, that it was due to your, you know, expertise. But no, the, the work was done by something. And, and this can be applied in so many different ways, how, how, how standards of living are increased 
by just you know um, people interacting and b making businesses and you know uh, attracting customers and pleasing the customers um, and for example like this is a great a, uh, example of when I talk about you know when they talk about child labor laws and how we need government because of the child labor laws and we you know if it wasn't for them then you know kids would be working 16 hour days no bathroom breaks and you know dying in the streets and things like that <laughs> and it's like no actually and the same thing with the minimum wage you know actually the the factories were becoming more and more you know of course they were much more um, difficult to work in as compared with today but they were improving at a rapid rate and once that was happening already then the government came in and said you know what let's make a law <laughs> children should not work but no it was already happening it, it just came in and, and took credit for it so do you plan on doing an episode about uh, the war on poverty by, uh, that uh, was put in by who was it LBJ LBJ um, probably at some point it's not something I have kind of on the front burner right now but you know it's definitely the type of thing I probably would get to eventually have, have you ever heard of the Cobra effect um, no I don't think so oh this is interesting um, so like uh, when Britain took over India right um, there was a the, 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 the Grand Chancellor or whoever the fuck it was that was over all of India there was a there was a cobra issue. They were just everywhere. They were biting troops. They were just crazy. And uh, what it what happened is is he said he would pay so much money or give so many pieces of silver for each uh, cobra head that per, each person brought in a day up to ten or whatever. So what happened is is cobra farms started hmm. have, started <laughs> popping up. So it's the it's the cobra effect that the most crazy version of the cobra effect is uh you know when the dutch owned the congo and they were farming all of the um the the rubber trees mm -hmm. uh if you couldn't bring in 10 trees a day you had to uh give a uh, you had to pay with a finger and uh finger farming became a, a good thing they would uh, the warlords would go into a vig village and just cut everybody's hand fingers off hmm. so they could they could bring them in and, and get money yeah. So it's it's this cobra effect. This is artificial demand uh, creates uh, adverse effects, and uh, I think uh, you you, ma you you mix the cobra effect with uh, the word boondoggle. That is what government is. <laughs> in my in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. Especially when it comes to those you know sorts of programs. You know, anytime anytime there's a subsidy for something or you know a bounty for something. Yeah. yeah. So um, I guess we should wrap up. Uh, do you want to maybe tell us your favorite quote of all time and then plug all your stuff one more time? Oh, geez. My favorite quote of all time. That's how, oh, how, Out how of all I... time. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing like putting you on the spot. Oh, man. Everyone's got recorded, their favorite quote. All of recorded history. <laughs> um, and, and my favorite one is – I'll probably screw it up because it's kind of long and I don't have it written in front of me. I have it on my wall at work. But not at home. Uh, it's from the uh, the anarchist uh, writer Edward Abbey, and he said something like, "Anarchism is not some crazy, you know, pie in the sky ideal. It's the hard headed realization after thousands of years ex of experience that we can't leave our lives up to presidents, generals, priests, and county commissioners." Mm -hmm. And, you know, I probably butchered the exact wording, but it's something like that. That's about right. I was going to say, that's pretty, from what I remember, that's pretty close. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's a great pretty quote. Good. That's a great quote. Yeah, and, and my website is profcj.org. Uh, that's where the Dangerous History Podcast is. Um, and, you know, iTunes, Stitcher, all those sorts of places. I'm on Twitter and Facebook, all that. So uh, I'd encourage everybody who's interested to go check that out and give my show a listen. We're, we're all a big fan. Aren't you afraid people won't go to your show because they think it's too dangerous? Or what? <laughs> um, that that probably would happen, but it means I'm self-selecting a very brave audience. Yes, <laughs> there you go. Only those with it. enough courage will find it. I love it. I love it. I love it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm just I'm just want to say I'm delighted. I found your your work is uh, you know it's wonderful to talk to you um, because I I have a lot of catching up to do and a lot of history to learn. So um, I'm happy that you are uh, challenging McGraw Hill. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, those, those I, I, fascist I, bastards. 
My what did, what was I saying the other day, Jeremy, about uh, endless repetition training with oh, the word yes. fascist? That's that's yeah, that's. Now, it's, it's now started to permeate my vocabulary on a regular basis, and it drives. <laughs> yeah, yeah you, you I, look around. I, I never, I never it, said the word that much until I met Dave. Once you um, understand it, you look around. You're like, <laughs> "Holy shit!" So, like this hat right here, it says Coca Cola on it. This hat is fascist. <laughs> yeah, it's like on They Live when you put on the sunglasses and you look <laughs> around, right? <laughs> Best analogy ever. I love Roddy yeah. Piper. So, yep. So, um, um, well, yes. I, I also I'd like to thank you for coming on. Um, I am. I, I too am I'm a big fan now. Um, I think I, I, I mentioned it to you on Twitter when I first found your show um, after hearing somebody talk about it on the Freedom Fiends. And uh, I, I'm looking forward to catching up on everything. You know, I listened to all the, the American Revolution and the past two follow, follow, hey, follow up ones you did. Um, and for me, even like I said, you know, history's kind of been my thing. That was my in. So even when it's stuff that I already know, I just love hearing other people's, you know, slightly different perspectives on it. And I always, at least for the you know the first eight episodes of your show that I've listened to, even though I knew a bunch of that stuff, I still picked up new knowledge on things I I already thought I knew, and that's for me that's great. I, I love coming across things like that because it does, it makes me happy. I, I just like Dave and and Danilo mentioned I'm I'm one of those people too that you know once I start learning I want to keep going. So um, I would highly encourage also anybody out there to uh, check out his show if you haven't already. Um, I, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure, just like the rest of us, you'll be hooked after one episode. Um, so, yeah. but again, thank, thanks for coming on. It's, it's, this has been great. Uh, hey. it's, uh, uh, thank you all very much. I, I very much enjoyed it. So, thanks for having me on. We'll, we'll have to have you come on when, uh, when Rand Paul wins or something. Right, <laughs> right, right, right. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, but no, like uh, I enjoyed this. If you ever want to come back on and talk about something specific, uh, oh yeah, oh, maybe yeah, drop some knowledge on us. We're down. Oh. Please come back. <laughs> okay. Yeah, maybe people we'll need to, people need to be educated about history <laughs> because right, what well. they they or, or or will say about the propaganda that they think they know of history. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. The the trouble isn't the ignorance; it's all the stuff they know that isn't true. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's what I tell people a lot of time. You're not debating that person or their ration when you're debating a, a sophist or a statist or whatnot. You're you're debating their 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 cognitive dissonance they're, you're debating their indoctrination and uh, you have to attack that not them so it's, it's a lot to learn but uh, yeah thanks so much for listening to the show guys um, the, for any and all of our stuff uh, check out theseedsofliberty.com we have Force to Freedom episode 3 coming out or 4 coming out I can't remember did Donnie do an episode this week uh, not that I know of. I think both of them were out this week, so there's. I don't believe there's going to be an episode this week, but uh, definitely check out uh, our Wednesday show if you haven't yet. It's uh, two. Um, it's uh, two ex uh, military guys who are now voluntarists, and they're just kind of giving you their world's view from that that lifestyle. So I definitely would check that out, guys. Thank you so much for checking us out. Um, go to our website, click on everything, and thanks for listening. Yes, please listen to Prof. CJ, Dangerous History Podcast. You will never be the same. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, everyone, for listening. Wonderful show. Um, so this is uh, the Seeds of Liberty Podcast. Uh, wishing everyone have a wonderful day. Take care. Peace. Bye. Bye.